And after about two weeks of trying to go to classes, I got a call from my dad telling me that the cancer had spread and that my mom was in the hospital. There's so many questions that just go through your mind. How is this going to affect them? Like, what can I do to help them? And should I still be going to school? Like, what? Uh, a lot of fear, too, just wondering, like, hey, is this going to happen to me as well? And a lot of anxiety and depression. Um, I lost pretty much all my passion for, like, anything. For, like, two years was just didn't want to do anything. That passion that I had for video was totally gone. Taking care of myself, that was gone. Just anything and everything, I just kind of lost it. It starts with just taking that leap. Man, you have to work hard. You have to be incredibly smart. Choose something that even if it fails, even if it fails you are going to be proud of it. doesn't matter how badly you got beaten in that. Be kind, be kind, be kind. Become a better person, a better leader, a better business. Go with your gut. I'm Samuel Donner, and this is Finding Founders. Hunter Williams witnessed his mother's diagnosis, prognosis, decline, and passing in the span of only two months and two weeks. And at the end of summer of 2016, he suddenly found himself stranded in the middle of his life, unable to move forward in any direction. Fast forward to today, and Hunter Williams is a full-time YouTuber known for his sharp, well-edited video essays on the business of being a content creator. From hitting millions of views on his deep dive analyses of Mr. Beast and Mark Rober to receiving a video response from Cody Co himself, Hunter might be on the path to creating his very own YouTube empire. Yet before he converted his garage into a home studio and embarked on this creator journey, Hunter was just a young kid with a point and shoot camera. Miles deep into the rural countryside and 20 minutes from the nearest small town, there was a time when he didn't even know YouTube existed. We'll get back to the podcast right after this break. Business Made Simple, hosted by Donald Miller, is brought to you by the HubSpot Podcast Network, the audio destination for business professionals. Hosted by Donald Miller, Business Made Simple takes the mystery out of growing your business. One of my favorite episodes is about how you can create a subscription model for your business. Like what if you had recurring revenue that covered most, if not all of your monthly expenses? Anything on top of that would be pure profit and maybe money towards that yacht. So if your business is seasonal or has highly fluctuating monthly cash flow, a subscription model could help you stabilize your revenue stream and cover your monthly overhead. So listen to Business Made Simple wherever you get your podcasts. And now back to the podcast. So I actually, you mentioned like hey, you, you've been been making this YouTube channel for a little bit, but you've been making videos basically your whole life. So uh, could you tell me like the first video that you ever made? Do you remember? So I was thinking about this too, man. I can't remember which one it is, but the oldest video that I have saved is my little sister, Ava. It's her first birthday. And I've just got a video of her just eating cake and screaming. <laughs> and that's it's just like a short 10 second clip. But that's the first video or oldest video I have saved. And the camera that I filmed it with was a, uh, it's like a cheap little point and shoot camera that was probably like a hundred bucks. Awful quality, but uh, terrible terrible audio terrible video like can barely even tell what's going on um and so i'm curious like how how your maybe like first interaction with youtube started so i grew up in a very small town and out in the country with nothing to do so my brother and i we had to be very creative to entertain ourselves and i think around eight is when we finally got access to internets and around that time, I started playing a game called RuneScape. Um, you know, you had to go through quests and, you know, level up certain skills and uh, earn gold coins and stuff like that. And at a certain point, I discovered YouTube through tutorials, like learning, like, hey, how do I beat this certain quest? Or, you know, what's the best way to make money on RuneScape? And eventually, yeah, found YouTube, started just binging these tutorials of how to get better at this game. And at a certain point, I realized, I was like, hey, there's actually other content on this website besides just like RuneScape tutorials. I looked at those things and I was like, dude, this is crazy that these kids are just like filming videos by themselves and uploading it to this website and getting, 
you know, thousands and in some cases, millions of views. It was mind blowing to me. Yeah. So did you think you, that like you wanted that to be you as well? Like you had this yes. interest in film. Yeah. Well, before this, I had, I had no interest. Yeah. And at first this was, I had, I didn't even have a camera at this point. And so, um, and for my 10th birthday, my mom and dad got me that little point and shoot camera, small, super cheap. But uh, what was really special about this camera is it allowed you to pause the recording. So essentially, like I could edit videos without actually having to use like an editing software. And so my brother and my friends, we would like make these little sketches. You know, we'd start recording. I'd say something. We'd pause the recording. I'd pan it to my brother. My brother would say something, pause the recording. And so we just started making these sketches. Uh, these little prank videos. I started making Lego stop motion videos, just anything and everything, pretty much. I think in the back of my mind, part of me was like, hey, maybe someday, like, I can start being a YouTuber and really taking this seriously and uploading it. But at this point, it was pure experimentation and just, you know, following my passion, just making whatever I wanted to make. Was there a point where it's like, oh, like, you know, maybe this can develop into like a path for myself? Yeah, I think that happened probably around high school. Um, like I said, I was in a small town and nobody knew how to make videos in that small town. And so eventually I started to like form an identity of like, hey, I'm, you know, the person in this town that can make videos. And so I started uh, doing productions for like a church and small businesses around the town and found out like, hey, like I can actually make money doing this thing. And then my, I think it was my junior year of high school, I went to New York to a film camp. And this was like my first time ever being around anybody else that was interested like in filmmaking. And we got to make three little short films while we were there. And uh, I think through that process, I started to really enjoy the, um, I started to really get interested in like the traditional route of filmmaking. Like, hey, okay, maybe, maybe it's not YouTube. Maybe it's not, you know, just making videos for companies. Maybe like someday I want to go make movies. And so as you're approaching college, are you um, are you still thinking, okay, like this is the, the, this kind of like traditional film world is the one that I want to enter in? During college, I was still uploading some of these videos. I was still making like sketches with friends that were not funny at all, just very ridiculous. On YouTube? Um, yeah, 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 yeah. I was uploading them to YouTube. And it, again, it wasn't like, let's see how many views we can get from this. It was more of just, hey, let's, let's entertain ourselves. Let's make something fun. Um, in a certain point near the end of high school, I kind of started to realize like, hey, there's not, there's probably not a future in this YouTube thing. Like it was what, 2013, 2014 at that point. Like I didn't understand like, hey, you can actually start a business through YouTube. You can make money through YouTube. I had no idea. And so I kind of started to think like, hey, I need to, you know, that was a childish hobby. I need to start pursuing something that will actually, you know, provide me a good career and allow me to make money. And so I think that's why I kind of started going more of the, uh, the traditional route. Hmm. Um, and what did that traditional route look like? It looked like me going to off to college to study film and, uh, digital media. What was it like? What was college like for you? Was it, uh, as interesting as you thought the film world would be? Yeah, I, I think the first semester was like a big, uh, wake up like it was very tough for me just because you know I coming I'm coming from the small town uh, very small class and small friend group and going off to this area where there's thousands of people was uh was pretty tough and I'm like a very I'm a very quiet person too I'm pretty socially anxious so being in an environment like that where I knew nobody was very very tough at the beginning yeah do you, do you, is there like any like specific memory that jumps out i don't know if there's any specific but i just remember spending most of that semester in my dorm room just not leaving i'd, I'd leave to go to class and then immediately come back and just i wouldn't socialize at all i don't know if there's a really what were you doing with all that time were you just studying or um watching netflix and 
playing League of Legends. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. it, was, it seems like you're really like isolating yourself. Yeah, dude, one hundred percent. I I think that, you know, I told you I came from like a very isolated home too. I mean, we lived in the middle of the country, twenty four acres, just us all by ourselves. So that's what I was. I was used to that. Yeah. So I mean, how did you like get out of that that rut, or 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 did you? Yeah, no, I I, I definitely did. It, uh, it took a lot. It was tough. I mean, I just had to get out of my comfort zone and say, hey, like I don't want to spend my college experience just you know by myself. I want to go out and make friendships and you know do exciting things and have great memories to look back on. Yeah. And so, what was the turning point? What did you do? I think it was as silly as it sounds joining a fraternity like actually building up the confidence to go into this group of just random people that I did not know and just say like hey like I like you guys you know I want to be your friends and socializing with them that really was the turning point I think yeah uh, and how did that how did that change your experience um a lot man I, I still those guys are still some of my best friends that like I met through that experience and uh, just gave me um, a community, and like a tribe to actually have throughout college. Yeah, so you're building up that tribe. Um, and I wanna circle it back to uh, some of the, um, I guess like some of the film work you were doing. So I joined, um, started going to Baylor in the fall of 2014, and I was going there to study film and digital media. And pretty fast, I realized that the program was learning about like the history of filmmaking. We were just watching old movies, you know, and taking tests that were asking, you know, who used what camera to, you know, make a certain film. And I was like, I don't see how this is going to help me, you know, get better at this. And so I stayed in the film, uh, stayed as a film major for one year or one semester. And I switched to business the second semester. It was the summer of 2016 after my sophomore year going into my junior year. And my dad, mom, got me and my brother in the kitchen and kind of circled us around and proceeded to tell us that my mom had a tumor in her ovaries and that they didn't know if it was cancerous, but you know that we just needed to know that some stuff was gonna be happening in the future. Um, and then fast forward, I think two weeks later, I was sitting on the bed with my mom, my brother, my sister, and we knew that my mom was expecting a call to like let her know if the tumor was cancerous. And my mom picked up the phone and just saw her talking and then she just burst into tears. So later found out that that call was telling her that she had stage four um, ovarian cancer. Like, what was your reaction? Like being an older brother at that time, I felt like I had this responsibility to, you know, be the strong sibling and act like I wasn't, you know, scared and fearful. But deep down, I was very scared. Was there anyone that you could like lean on? Actually, yeah, I, I had a very, very good friend named Jonathan Arp that was like an amazing friend at that time, like just helped me through a lot. But after we found out, I, I uh, continued to try to go to like classes in college. Like after about two weeks of trying to go to classes, I got a call from my dad telling me that the cancer had spread and that my mom was in the hospital. And so immediately just dropped everything and uh, went to the hospital and just kind of stayed with her for about two weeks. Through that time, I really got to let her know how much she meant to me. Um, it was a very, very difficult time just being in a situation like that. But I, I think that I'm grateful. We got to tell each other how we really felt. And I think from that, like I learned, if you have opportunities to do things like that, it is very important to take advantage of it. I think beforehand, like I kind of expressed, I was a very quiet person and reserved, and I still am in a lot of ways. But now if I've got an opportunity to express like true gratitude, I always take advantage of that opportunity. Has the cancer developed? How did your your life change? 
so she found out she had cancer. And then two months later, we all was in the hospital with her for about two weeks. And after two weeks, uh, she passed away. And immediately, yeah, I was just very angry and obviously sad and just didn't know what to think. Um, you know, like, where do I go from here? Like, what is my life going to look like without a mom? You know, at 20 years old, that's a, you know, just a crazy question. Um, and also just didn't know, you know, what is my dad going to do? What about my little brother and my little sister? Like, how is this going to affect them? Like, what can I do to help them? And should I still be going to school? Like what? There's so many questions that just go through your mind. And I lost pretty much all my passion for like anything for like two years was just didn't want to do anything. I had to like learn how to um, navigate the world without a mom and live without a mom. How did you begin to navigate it on your own? It was definitely a very slow process, but I obviously I had great friends and family and going to therapy, all of those things helped. And she had always preached that you have some type of control over how, you know, obstacles in life affect you. And so I realized that I had a decision to, you know, I had control over how this this obstacle affected me. And I made a choice that was like, I want this, I want my mom passing away to make me a better person. I don't want to become, you know, just sad for the rest of my life and negative. I want to be a joyful person and let, let this, that this really shitty thing that happened, I want it to make me stronger in the end. And nearing like the end of college, how are you thinking about like planning a path forward? Most of college, I was like, just focused. Like, I just want to get my degree. Both of my parents and grandparents, like, never graduated college. And so I was going to be the first one. And I knew that it was something that was very important to my mom. And so it was just like, hey, I don't know what I'm doing after, but like, I just need to get this degree. So after I did, I started to think again, like, okay, you know, I, I was in a better state, had made a lot of progress, improved a lot. Um, and some of that passion for video started to come back a little bit again. It had been like two years or probably longer than that since I had touched a camera or did anything, but started to think more like, okay, what would a life like this look like? F mostly filming stuff for like restaurants was like the main thing, just making little videos for their Instagram or their website, just stuff like that. And eventually I got hired by a video production company. I thought that, Hey, like I. I think long-term, like what I want to do with my life is build a video production company. I think that, that was my goal. And I was like, the best way to do this is going to be, you know, learn from the inside. Exactly. And so I joined this production company and was just doing anything and everything. I was editing. I was a production assistant, an AC, DP, directing, just all over the place, just absorbing anything and everything. What was it like? It was a lot less glamorous than I expected. <laughs> You didn't really have much control over what you got to make and being in a service-based business like that was very tough too. I got to talk to the owner of the company a lot. Like anytime I could just sit him down and just speak to him and just, you know, pick his mind and ask him any question I would. And I just started to realize like, okay, I don't know if I really want to spend my life building a business like this. Was it just because like, because it was unglamorous, because like, You'd peel back like because it was just not creative. We'll get back to the podcast right after this break. We all have bad habits. Some of us, it's, you know, not stacking the dishwasher, not taking out the trash, uh, maybe picking your nose in the car when you think no one's looking, but everyone on the freeway can see it, including on the off chance of one of your coworkers, which is just one way bad habits tend to find their ways into business. From emailing clients at who knows o'clock or spending way too much time and money on legacy software your IT person grandfathered in. That stuff is old and needs to be destroyed. We're breaking up with bad business habits right now, right here. It's 2023, no bad business habits here. HubSpot's all-in-one CRM platform can help you get there. It makes it easy to better connect your teams, data, and systems so you can better connect with your customers. Best of all, it's free to get started. So learn how HubSpot can help your business grow better in 2023 at HubSpot.com.
And now back to the podcast. I felt like at the time, it's, it, I thought there was a better path. I started to think a lot about how much I had learned from like talking to, talking to this guy that owned the company. And my dad is an entrepreneur too. And I started to think like, how much could I learn if I went and worked for my dad for a bit and just got to ask him questions about running a business? So that's what I did. And I started working for my dad and my grandma's company and kind of the same thing just started from the bottom i was packing stuff just kind of learning anything and everything getting to ask them questions um but pretty soon i realized that they were um wanting me to kind of run the company eventually yeah and what exactly was the company doing they sold convenience store supplies like toilet paper and cleaning chemicals and receipt rolls just anything that a convenience store needs to run like they sell it and like what was the state of that company were you uh, like w was any part of you excited about it at first i was i was pretty excited yeah just something new like being in a new environment like that and getting to just learn you know the game that they were playing and how the company worked and the products that they were selling after about a year of doing it, I started to think like, okay, I started to get bored a little bit and started to think a lot more about um, about YouTube again. What were you thinking about in terms of YouTube? I don't know when it was, but I realized that YouTube is a business and that you can actually make money doing this thing. It was a lot different than 2014 in high school when I was like, oh, people are just doing it for fun. I started to realize like, oh my gosh, people are making millions of dollars doing YouTube. I love YouTube. And just started to question like, what would it look like if I actually pursued, pursued YouTube like for real and just went all in on this? Where were you learning this information that YouTube could become a career? Colin and Samir was the main way, dude. As immediately when I found their videos, I just started binging everything. They make videos kind of covering the creator economy and talking about really like the business side of YouTube and TikTok and just these creator businesses. They dive in and talk about how they're making their money, how much money they're making, how they're telling stories. And I think Colin and Samir is a super interesting example of a pair of creators just because like they had such a meandering road to get to the place they are. Like and it's only really like in the last like one, two years where Colin and Samir started becoming the arbiters of information about creators and how to become a creator on YouTube. And I think that mm -hmm. has inspired so many people. And I think co coinciding with that, like it was like five years since your your mother had passed away. Yeah. And yeah. so did that did that feel like it marked a like a turning point? One hundred percent, man. Yeah. And I started to just think a lot about how fast you know it goes by, and just really you know wanting to make sure that I was spending my life doing something that I loved. And so that was a massive part of it as well. Is is knowing that if I didn't at least give it a shot, that I would have so much regret. So how did you transition to, you know, pursuing this dream? Obviously I talked to my family and told them that, you know, thank you for everything, but, um, you know, I really wanted to give this YouTube thing a shot. I had to talk to Carrie, my wife, because obviously it's a crazy thing to quit your job to start doing YouTube. And, and at the time I only had, I think 20 subscribers. <laughs> So like, what is the plan though? 20 subscribers and a dream. Pretty much, dude, pretty much. And I had a little bit of a plan. I knew how to, you know, make videos and edit. Like I'd worked at the production company, been making videos since, you know, around 10. Um, knew a lot about it. And obviously there's people like Peter McKinnon and all these different creators that kind of teach filmmaking. And I was like, hey, like I can start doing that as well. And at the time, it was really easy to grow an audience on TikTok. And so my plan was I'm going to start doing stuff on TikTok and move that audience over to YouTube. And so um, I started doing a series on TikTok. The first thing that I ever posted was uh, I turned my garage into a YouTube studio. And it was like a 10 part series or something like that. But through this, like, Within a couple of weeks, my channel went from 20 subscribers to like over a thousand pretty quickly. I remember just refreshing my phone, looking at the numbers being like, oh my God, like this is actually working? A thousand? Um, but something I didn't say, uh, I meant to say is my wife and I, we made a deal 
when I quit my job to start doing YouTube. And the steal was that we would give me a year pursuing YouTube, just solely YouTube. And the goal was to hit 10,000 subscribers. If I couldn't hit 10,000 subscribers, probably isn't for me. Um, so yeah, hitting hitting 1,000 subscribers pretty quickly felt amazing. <laughs> Was that video, uh, the, the garage like setup video, that was what you did on YouTube as well? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I did the series on TikTok. It was just, you know, I forget how many parts there were. It was a ton, but I would just be, you know, part so-and-so. And this time I'm laying the floor for, you know, in the garage. And this time I'm building the desk. And then eventually I compiled all those things and made like a long form YouTube video out of it. From that, where, what were you thinking of, of doing next? So I realized that, like I said, <clears throat> I know a lot about filmmaking and editing, post-production, all those things. And I was like, okay, I'm going to start doing, you know, content around filmmaking. So I started making TikToks. TikTok was doing well. And these videos were getting views and my TikTok account was growing pretty well. And mm -hmm. uh, did a couple of videos about filmmaking as well on YouTube. They didn't do anything at all, but TikTok was going well. And so I kind of started leaning more into that. And did that for a few months, just kind of focusing on TikTok. But at a certain point, I realized, I was like, hey, like I I quit my job to do YouTube. Like I want to be a YouTuber, not a TikToker. And kind of just stopped doing TikTok completely. I love making, being able to tell like a long form story. And I saw more of an opportunity to do that on YouTube. So you were like, okay, I'm going to just focus completely on YouTube. You have this goal in your mind of 10,000 followers. What are like the strategies you, you use to, to make that happen? So that first one, yeah, was obviously TikTok. And then I, I just got to a point where, so I started leaning more into like the filmmaking content and I did that for a few videos. I was working on a video called like how to talk to a camera for introverts, something like that. And I was like 80% of the way through of making this video and i was like i'm not enjoying this at all like this video is probably not going to get any views i'm not having any fun i quit my job to do this like why am i making this and so i just completely scrapped that video and i started working on a video that i had been thinking about for a while called um why van neistat is a better youtuber than casey and so started working on that video it was something that i was just super intrigued by just really excited me a topic that I wanted to learn. And so this video was pretty much go through and talk about how Van Neistat is an artist and Casey Neistat is an entrepreneur and kind of telling their story, kind of comparing both of these mindsets in this video. And I had a great time making the video and it was the first video that kind of hit the algorithm. Like it was getting views on its own, not, you know, externally through TikTok or anything like that. It actually kind of hit the algorithm and nothing crazy, but was actually getting views. And so I was like, okay, like yeah. there's something here with this. And in your mind, was that a indicator that the, the like, uh, core of your channel was going to be creator focus and stories about creators? Maybe a little bit, but I think the biggest thing that I was doing was just like pursuing a story in a video that like really excited me. It's interesting. Yeah. Like yeah. something that I was like, yo, this sounds really, really fun to make. Like I would love to dive into this topic. And, um, I think once that video did do well, it was like, okay, like I can probably do this with other creators as well. You know, you're, you're probably at this point, like somewhat on track to hit 10 K even at that, that growth rate. Yeah, yeah. Um, what video do you focus on next? Uh, I've been a big fan of Cody Cove for years now. I'm just, Always enjoyed watching his content. He's, uh, so he's a YouTuber. He did start on Vine, just making content, but now he's, his main focus is YouTube and he makes, uh, reaction content. And a lot of the times his content is him kind of shitting on people <laughs> for the most part. A lot of the times. Yeah. Just roasting people and just mostly humor and comedy, like reaction content. So I had started making these videos about creators and have been thinking a lot I'm like, okay, like I love Cody. Um, I don't, I don't, I don't think a video about him would like do super well or anything like that. It just seemed like something fun to make. Like I wanted to learn more about his story. Um, I had recently listened to a podcast that Ian Borthwick did with him and found it super fascinating and was like, okay, I want to dive more into this. And so pretty fast, I just kind of 
dove into his story. After I think three or four days, I started looking at the analytics and the analytics were going up. And I'm like, oh my God, like this video might actually get some views. Hit it. Yeah, like it's actually hitting the algorithm. And then it just started exploding. Like I remember refreshing my phone and it's getting like thousands of views per hour, which had never happened. I remember waking up one morning, I think it was two weeks later. So the video was at like 250,000 views. And I woke up one morning and I was at 9,993 subscribers. And so I just sat in front of my computer, just clicking refresh, 9,997, refresh, 9,999, refresh, 10,000. And just freaking out being like, oh my God, like I fucking hit the goal. And then I scroll down, literally three seconds later, I scroll down and the top comment is in all caps. Somebody commented, oh my God, Cody reacted. And I just start, I freaked out, I lost it. Cody reacted on his channel to your video? Mm hmm and so I didn't know what that meant at first. So me, I just go to YouTube, type in Cody Co. And the first thing that comes up is a thumbnail with his face and my face right next to it. And I'm just like, wait, what? And I watched the video and he's like super nice. Like immediately is like, oh my God, dude, like this video is edited so well and like, compliments my research and the lighting in the video and says that he's actually learning stuff from it. And at the end of the video, he's like, Hunter, like phenomenal job. Like you've got a lot of potential, dude. And I was like, wow, okay. Like I can do this thing. Like I can, I can actually do this YouTube thing. When somebody that you look up to that much says that, it gives you so much confidence. From like from that point, I was like, okay, like I'm doing this. I was like, okay, Cody did well. I'm just gonna take the same packaging, the same style, but I'm gonna make it about one of the biggest YouTubers, Mark Rober. I was like, this video, it's gonna explode. It's gonna blow up, guaranteed. And spent a uh, pretty good time making this video and posted it and nothing happened. I'm getting a little bit of views, but nothing's happening at all. A week goes by, still no views. Two months goes by, still no views. Three months goes by, still no views. Two months. And six months later, finally this video finally hits the algorithm. And yeah, you look at it now, it's got over a million views. That's insane. That That is the longest tale I've, uh, for, for like a view explosion I've heard. Dude, it was, yeah. It, the, the amount of excitement that I had when that video started doing well, just because when I posted it, I was like, dude, this is guaranteed. It has to do well. And for six months, just nothing it was just dead the mr beast video like i wonder i'm, I'm curious what the uh the tr progression of that video was that one exploded immediately that one i spent a lot of time on that uh the packaging for that video as well probably like two weeks of just thinking about you look at it now and it's so simple mr beast is broke or mr beast is going broke like Super simple, but I spent so much time just thinking about like the best title. I had so many options and designing different thumbnails. But at that point, I was like, yeah, Squid Game, his Squid Game video was about to come out. And I, I felt pretty confident about that video. So yeah, it, it blew up pretty fast. I, I want to talk a little bit about how you think about performance. How do you view um, what it means to have a successful video on your channel? And how are you optimizing for that? Yeah, I, I think after just talking to a lot of my friends and people that have been doing it longer than me, I feel like the most important thing is for sure just um, making a video that you're passionate about and that, you know, you feel like is a special video and something that, you know, you can tell that you put a lot of work into and that you're not doing it just to get, you know, views or money. How are you feeling about where you are in the journey right now? I feel like I'm in an okay spot. Um, where I want to go with it, I've been thinking a lot about like the last month, just really questioning what direction I want to go because I enjoy making these creator videos, but not nearly as much as I did when I first started doing this. I'm trying to find videos where the passion is there, where I'm just, you know, I wake up in the morning and I'm pumped to like make this video. So I've done a lot of journaling recently, trying to figure out what my why is for my channel and trying to build around that. Cause right now it's very non-existent. It's just like, okay, make, make videos about creators, get views. It's kind of what I've been doing. Like there's no real, you know, why around it. And so I've done a lot of journaling and exercises trying to figure out what that is. And then I'm going to try to build once I have that figured out. This like in this journey that, uh, that you've taken with 
diving straight into YouTube. What do you think the biggest lesson you've learned um, has been? And if you were to tell like, you know, the person that started the channel, um, like, you know, not too long ago, like what, what advice would you give yourself um, at that starting point, at that transition point? And what advice would you give other creators that are at the beginning of their journey? And just like make videos that you're excited about, like things that really make you curious. Anytime I've experienced success on my channel, it's been from doing that, being like, hey, I love Cody Co. I really want to find out, you know, his story and why he's successful. And then that video did well. Same with Mark Rober. But like anytime I've done that and made that switch, and, and, you know, not prioritizing, you know, what video is going to get views or, um, you know, make the most money, which is something that I really, really want to make right now. That's when I've experienced the most success. And it's super hard to do. <laughs> it's super hard. But I think especially at the beginning when you're trying to figure out, you know, what route that you want to go with your channel. I think that's the most important thing. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, DM us at Finding Founders Podcast on Instagram, LinkedIn, or Facebook. Finding Founders is produced and hosted by me, Samuel Donner. Our chief of staff and operations is Jessica Lynn. Our audio editing team lead is Adrian Tapia. Support from Irene Van Berkel, Matt Fernandez, Renee B. Cannon, Sophia Donner, David Saidi, Ashley Jimenez, Nicholas Guzman, Aaron Devereaux, Sanessa Gisley, and Lois Choi. Our outreach and research lead is Kenny Ong. With support from Sarah Hobson, Cherise Tan, Harushi Kanauchi, Kristen Hagelin, Aya Cortez, and Valencia Lu. Our writing team lead is Elizabeth Bowen with support from Aiden Ashworth, Nikki Mukawa, Sylvie Wong, and Eric Menno. Our design team lead is Shruti Ramanand with support from Tiffany Dang, Yao Lu, and Dina Gabriel. To see more of what we're up to, subscribe to our newsletter at findingfounders.co. Thanks again for listening and see you next week.